Hi everyone and welcome to Unit 12, Module 69. Today we are talking about other disorders. Here are your learning objectives and here is your vocab. So somatic symptoms are bodily symptoms that have no physical origin. So conversion disorder and illness anxiety disorder are two um, that fall under this umbrella term that really just means that they're experiencing some sort of discomfort and there's no, they've been to the doctors and there's no explanation for it. They should be feeling okay. Um, sometimes this does occur in people who might be just experiencing something like anxiety, but maybe for cultural reasons or personal reasons, it's difficult for them to really identify that it is more of a mental illness um, that's causing it, or they're just not aware that it's a um, something like anxiety causing their hands to feel numb or their head to feel dizzy. Um, so certain cultures such as China um, and certain parts of Africa have uh, shown to describe symptoms of anxiety more in the physical aspect than the mental aspect. So conversion disorder. So this is one of the two under somatic symptom disorder. And this is where a person has a very specific, genuine physical symptom. Again, there's no physiological basis for it. So again, it's most likely that it's anxiety transformed into a physical symptom. And the patient could experience a bunch of things. For example, losing sensation, um, maybe like um, in their hand. And so you might try to like stick pins in it and ask them if they can feel it. And if, it, if they've lost feeling, like even though there's no neurological explanation for it, they really can't feel the pin um, or whatever you are doing to it. Um, paralysis has been seen with conversion disorder, blindness, inability to swallow, um, things like that are where there's a specific thing, physical issue going on. And there's no other explanation um, besides conversion disorder. So illness anxiety disorder, um, or you might be familiar with the term hypochondriac, and that comes from the old term of what we now call illness anxiety, where the person has normal physical sensations. See, whereas in conversion, they're not having normal sensations. But in illness anxiety, they're having normal physical sensations, but they're interpreting them as something horribly wrong with them. And so they will go to the doctor and they will um, try to figure out what's wrong. And the doctor might say, check them and say, you're completely fine. And they might go for a second opinion because they're still, they're convinced that something is horribly wrong with them. And so it's kind of this uh, cycle of um, anxiety and checking. Disassociative disorder. So again, this is another umbrella term and disassociative means we, when someone disassociates, they separate from themselves. So their thoughts, feelings, personality, memories, it kind of becomes separate from who they are. And this can cause them to walk kind of around aimlessly in a fugue state. Um, which is the idea that they're wandering from home and they're, they don't remember, they don't know who they are. They disassociated from it. Disassociative identity disorder is where the person is, again, going to disassociate, so separate from who they are and their memories, except this time the person with identity disorder picks up an alternate, at least one other alternate personality. Um, and takes that on. This is very rare, and there are people who question whether it even is a true um, disorder and find that pe some people might kind of see it in the DSM and then choose to um, play it up. So from 1930 to 1960, for example, the skeptics say, well, there were only two cases per decade, but when it was put into the DSM in 1980, there were 20,000 cases and the number of personalities had also increased from like three to seven or eight. 
Um, people who believe it say, no, there's more to it. Like you can look at the brain and see different brain patterns. You can see, um, their handedness change sometimes. Like, so some personalities are left-handed when everyone else is right-handed. Um, ophthalmologists notice key differences with eye movement and vision. Um, the psychodynamics psychologists, um, believe that it might be a defense mechanism for, anxiety and they're kind of playing out in their alternate personality things that they find unacceptable their their conscious finds unacceptable um it could also be a reaction to ptsd because most people who um have been diagnosed with did have experienced severe abuse as a child and so perhaps they've like um, in order to protect themselves, disassociated and created this alternate personality as a way to protect or um, kind of separate from what they're experiencing. So eating disorders, there are three eating disorders that we will talk about. The first is anorexia nervosa, and this is where the person maintains a starvation diet despite being significantly underweight. And so a key thing with anorexia nervosa is that the person is constantly obsessing and um, thinking about um, their weight or what they're eating and kind of obsessively um, doing these behaviors. So their whole day is focused on their calorie intake um, and what they're doing about it and what they're eating. Um, and also these, these horrible feelings of feeling um, fat um, because it's a disordered mind, even though they might not look fat. Um, bulimia is when the person alternates binge eating, usually a high calorie dense uh, food intake. And then that's fil that follows with some... Um, they feel awful and the way to kind of control that is to purge and that is uh, by vomiting usually and then excessive exercise and fasting also. So again here there's like a constant your day revolves around um, binging and purging and calorie intake and exercising and this has many negative health impacts um, all of these do not just like mental ish mental but physical um binge eating disorder is where they have those significant binge eating episodes and those are followed by um severe distress disgust um or guilt about those episodes but they don't have the purging um aspect like uh near bulimia does so studies find that there is a connection there's very um social cultural connections here with upbringing environment but also there is a genetic link where twins um identical twins are more likely to share the disorder um rather than fraternal twins but obviously there's a strong cultural um component into pushing people into what society says they are supposed to look like which with social media and photoshop and all that can be personality disorders um that is an umbrella term for a couple of disorders we're going to talk about but it's characterized in general by inflexible enduring behavior characteristics that impair someone's social functioning so there are three different clusters of categories and we're not going to study or even list them all here, but I'm going to give you an example, at least one for each category. So the first category is anxiety clusters. And these personality disorders um, obviously are linked to anxiety. And an example of this is avoidant personality, where the person has a fearful sensitivity to being rejected. Um, so very afraid of being rejected. So they become avoidant. And there is a second category that is eccentric or odd behaviors. And one um, personality disorder in that category would be schizoid personality disorder, where the person is very um, emotionless, very flat in their emotions, flat affect, and they are disengaged. 
And the third category is dramatic or impulsive behaviors. Dramatic or impulsive. So first being narcissistic personality disorder, which they are very self-focused and self-inflating. And um, another being histrionic personality disorder, where the person um, is very attention-getting, attention-seeking in their behavior. So here's just a chart to show you more detail on that. You do not have to know um, anything else besides what I have listed here. Um, but I just thought that some people might be curious, so I included this. And you can pause to look at it more if you'd like. So antisocial personality disorder is usually a man. And this is a personality disorder where the person has a lack of conscience for wrongdoing even towards friends and family members. So they really lack empathy. And they might be aggressive or really like ruthless. Um, some people kind of say, um, and there's research to support, that people who are more in high-powered um, business positions, such as CEOs, have a higher rate of having antisocial personality disorder just because um, they're um, able to do things like fire. Um, sometimes this is referred to as a sociopath or psychopath, but that's more informal language. You wouldn't find that in the DSM. And it starts off around age 15 where the person begins to lie, cheat, steal, or display unrestricted sexual behaviors, um, risky behaviors particularly. And um, when this is combined with a really you know, intelligent person um, and also perhaps someone who's a little immoral, like it could go bad. Um, twin and adoption studies show a biological link, but there is no single gene. We do notice that people with antisocial personality disorder have a low responding autonomic nervous system. So remember in the autonomic nervous system is your stress response. And for people with anxiety, for example, it's very high. People with antisocial personality, it does not, is not sensitive. It does not react well. So they actually don't get afraid as much as a t So there are strong genetic and environmental factors and they kind of like influence each other. So for example, child abuse, when a child's brain is still developing, can rewire the brain and that can affect that lack of empathy and it can affect especially the development of the frontal lobe which is for impulse control planning and judgment and actually the frontal lobes of criminals who have um, committed murder and have antisocial personality disorder show a smaller developed frontal lobe and so this might um, this does correlate to people who have also been abused as children. So there is this connection between the brain and the environment and that interaction and how it can affect um, their um, well-being. There are also problems at birth that there is a correlation with, such as lack of oxygen or premature birth, um, poverty and family instability, and um, not everyone who lives in poverty and instability is going to develop antisocial personality disorder, but those that seem to have a genetic predisposition to be more sensitive to maltreatment um, have um, an increased risk of antisocial personality disorder. They also show to have a hyperreactive dopamine system. So dopamine is that reward, pleasure, um, neurotransmitter, and that is very strong. So when you combine that dopamine uh, system being very strong with a lack of impulse control in the frontal lobe, that um, is what can lead to antisocial personality. So takeaways, remember your somatic disorders. Those are the disorders that have physical um, issues or anxiety related issues, even though there is no medical explanation for them. There are three eating disorders that you need to know, anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating. Make sure you understand the difference between all three. 
personality disorders, um, narcissistic and antisocial are the two most important that I went over. Um, all of these disorders have bio, psycho, and social origins. So make sure you understand that. Um, remember that disassociate means to disconnect from reality, from yourself. Um, and disassociative identity disorder is when you disconnect from yourself and you create an alternate self. So that sums up module 69 and I will see you in class. Thanks guys.